Good evening, everybody. I am Tina Brock, and I am your host for Into the Absurd, which is our weekly virtually existential dinner conversation where we pull up to the table and we chat with creators and folks in the community doing very interesting work. I'm coming to you virtually from London today where we will have a conversation with Todd Hilsey and London will figure into that conversation when we get to the part about Harold Pinter and Todd's work on the uh, play, the, the Caretaker with the Hudson Theater Works. And there's so much for us to talk about. Todd is a mass communication expert where he works um, notifying victims of, of, of problems uh, with, with things that, we will, that will become apparent in just a couple of minutes. He's far more knowledgeable. <laughs> he is an international expert on this. Todd Hilsey, welcome to Into the Absurd. This among so many other things that you do in your world as a producer, as an actor, as an, uh, an environmental advocate for children, helping them to, to understand things. Welcome to Into the Absurd. Thank you, Tina. Yeah, Appreciate it's, it. it's, so, it's just so interesting the way all of these passions and projects of yours intersect. So in order to get that puzzle going, let's, let's go back, if we can, to you came out of Penn State, right? And you started to work in marketing and advertising. Um, at Foot Conan Building. So tell us about those, I'm going to guess, Mad Men days. Well, it was, it was working with Mad Men, for sure. <laughs> Fantastic uh, experiences, starting out literally one of those ground up experiences. If you, you, you were talking a little bit about advertising, you have some sense of the advertising agency world. Starting out, you know, you're, when you're starting out in advertising, you're starting out as an intern, you're doing, you know, grunt work. You know, and and I started out and re turned down and found a really great, a small uh, uh, agency called McAdams and Ong doing fantastic, cool work for some interesting clients who appreciated good creative work. And two leaders, Brian McAdams, Tom Ong, were um, just uh, had New York and you know packaged food experienced and. At Madison Avenue backgrounds and, and brought to Philadelphia at that time sort of a new energy and it was really fun a lot of us in our 20s starting out figuring out how to you know how to navigate and try to make a difference in the advertising world um, mm -hmm. so that's, that's where I started and, um, and went from there to uh, to Lewis and Gilman which was an, old, an ad agency uh, that, uh, that you know, those in advertising remember Bob Wilder and you know, it's uh, and it was sort of the, it was sort of the, um, I don't know, the, how, how would you describe it? it was sort of like the, uh, the, the well-heeled side of the advertising agency uh, world in Philadelphia, where, you know, there was, you know, there was, a, there was, there was, there was this butler that brought drinks, you know, in through the side door to Mr. Wilder when he needed like a, you know, a glass of water on a little tray. And it was that kind of experience. So but, it really uh, did. It, Mad Men lives up to its name. Mad Men days. Right. They take and, it. So, ha yeah. And people like Kay Christian, who was, uh, you know, a brilliant writer, but definitely mad from the 60s. She was, she was probably like the first, I don't know, maybe the first female Mad Men. Mad Men. Anyway, great work. Great, great experiences um, and some crazy times because it was sort of like, you know, in great wild friendships <laughs> i put it that way yeah. we worked all hours of the day and night too it didn't matter it's like you're, yeah. it was like college you're working all nighters to get something it seems like they yeah that that, that, that world was was well captured in the series yeah, yeah. sort of working all night so how did you then tell us about 60 minutes and you becoming this internationally recognized expert for work that came out of you know well, a, a project there yeah, which well, is, it was, it go all the way back. I was sitting there at Lewis and Gilman, which was Foot Cone and Belding at the time. They were bought out by the Chicago, big Chicago firm. And I was like the last account executive sitting there, you know, late one night. President comes around, the man, this man came from South Africa to run um, Foot Cone back then. And he's like, we got this strange project from these lawyers, you know, and we need, here, you do it, you know, because I'm the only one there. And I was like, I saw it handed this project but everybody else would look looked at it and it's like this is boring it's like lawyers 
and you just have to do a legal notice. Well, it, it turned out it was the largest class action against all of the airlines for the, for the allegation that they were fixing prices, which they, let's face it, they did. Remember, you remember the days when, when you know, one airline would drop their price from Philadelphia to Chicago, and then all the other airlines would immediately have the same price because they were sharing this joint reservation system. And so 50 million air travelers were affected. And it was the first case really where they, back at that point, if you didn't have a list of all the people that you had to send a notice to, then you couldn't have a class action, essentially. And this was the first case where it was, where a, where in lieu of a big mailing, it was a developing a large advertising program to reach these audiences and prove to the judge that you effectively reached this whole mass uh, okay. audience. So that was your job was to make sure you got to all those people? And defend it and defend it. So I had to go to court and, you know, and I'm this like young accounting executive and I had to go to court to defend this program and say, I know your honor that we can reach whatever it was, X percent of this target population with effectively informing them of their rights. And, he, and, the, and all these lawyers from the different airlines all the major airlines and all of their big defense lawyers got up and one by one cross-examined me and I defended the program and I said, I know because, because this is what we do in advertising. We document, uh, you know, how we, how we can re how we know. We're how you can reach, reach that many people. Right. Wow. And so that went on to, uh, to other clients, well, Remington and. I, so I did that program. Then I go back to the normal world of advertising. And I was doing clients like, the Franklin Institute, like I'm really, that was really fun. We helped them open their, what was their open, their future center. And I was the guy like in charge of that Franklin Institute campaign. They let us do really fun work. We did like billboards with laser beams between them. Uh, we, we, you know, we were doing, you know, other big clients. I mean, some of the clients in the agency were back then Bell Atlantic. Uh, we did mm -hmm. Yellow Pages, but Yellow Pages, remember, was a big, a big, that was a big client when they were Yellow Pages. We did the Pennsylvania lottery. I think. So, so going back to doing regular, you know, non-legal advertising for a while. And then I was like, I, you know, I knew I wanted to work for myself. I didn't want to, you know, I, I told you earlier, I don't take, I don't take from others very well. I don't, I don't. <laughs> you don't play with others in the sandbox. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> well, That's not know. my experience of watching you work, but uh, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> But um, you wanted to do your own thing. No, I, so I had this idea to start a, to start to write a screensaver. Well, first I was going to first I developed a, video, a little mailer. I thought I'm going to develop this little mailing package so people can send their videos to their loved ones. And they used to have these little small, uh, you know, small video cassettes. And I thought, oh, that'd be yeah. fun. Well, that went nowhere. And then I thought <laughs> <laughs> I found these engineers at, at University of Pennsylvania. I forget how I met them. But um, I said, hey, can you guys, back then, the only, the only screensaver was these little fish floating across your screen. Mm -hmm. that, why, I thought to myself, why can't we have our own pictures and video and personalize? You know? So that was just a, an idea I had. I said, well, maybe if I develop something like that, I could find an outlet for it. And I found these engineers at the University of Pennsylvania, and they're like, yeah, we could code that. And sure, sure enough, they coded this really cool interface and with the functionality of allowing you to have your own photographs. And this was like a big thing because it was Windows, the early days of Windows. And, um, and we did develop it for Windows, not for, for, for Mac or Macintosh at the time. And, um, and it uh, was the first, and it was, became the first Windows certified screensaver that allowed you to have your own personalized photographic and later on video content. Um, and we, we came out with it and I, and I was like, all right, well, I, I left, you know, Lewis and Gilman I was this brazen idea to have this cool, uh, software company. And, uh, and it, I started pushing it and I, uh, uh, you know, I had some success, <laughs> a couple companies that made software products licensed it. One of which was, uh, a, 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 a product called calendar creator. And they had a license agreement with sports illustrated for, uh, for Sports Illustrated's content, including their swimsuit uh, and uh, photographs, and that, that it went in the package, you know, with those products. Um, and I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. But then, of course, the royalties you get 
on that or like like point zero 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 uh one penny for every whatever unit so you're it's not it wasn't really a money making venture but then you know we we're still pushing it and we i got it into walmart i got it into a pretty decent distribution in walmarts and targets and, um with uh, with another product i jim henson and the muppets licensed it i had the muppet screensaver that was pretty cool we had kermit the frog bursting through the page but um but then the next version of windows came out and bill gates basically took my software took my code and and embedded it into windows and so every the next version of windows was came with it was everything that my, my software did so it's like you're instantly instantly out of business obsolete obsolete yeah yeah but the ideas that created all of that the the germ of wisdom from which it sprung is is still there and uh yeah, and, and i was, but but right then right then it was like and i'm you know i'm working out of my house and right then i get a call from a lawyer who had read a legal opinion he said are you todd he'll see from the airlines case i go well yeah i guess i did that case five years ago and he's like did you know you're written up in this legal uh, reporter, which is the federal reporter series, which is legal precedent and pretty nice comment from the judge who agreed with my testimony, ruled in, in my client's favor. And as a result, created sort of the class action notification by using media um, to reach victims of, you know, abuses, defective products, uh, because there's an obligation when there is a class action to notify it's a constitutional due process is what it is because when there's a class action it's kind of backwards intuitive in our country you are automatically included unless you say otherwise mm -hmm. pursuant to receiving a notice so notice you could without notice you you could be sucked into a class action and then the lawyers would lose and you'd lose all your rights to recover and it could be a big claim that you may have with you know if you have a, let's say you have you know big claim for injuries you suffered from whatever breast implants you know being addicted to tobacco uh, roundup you know mm -hmm. cancer caused by a roundup if you don't get a notice you don't opt out now you're bound in there and then they lose the trial you've lost your ability to claim so it's it's a significant duty and obligation that courts have and so from that point courts started looking to experts to design programs and it was that it was such a niche field there's me and another mm -hmm. one another woman in Washington, D.C. named Kathy Kinsella were the two people doing that for every class action around the country. And there were a few others, Jeannie Finnegan, mm -hmm. Wayne Pines. Um, oddly enough, Wayne Pines, uh, was, uh, who was in the news because from trying to help the FDA tell the truth yesterday, he was, he was a class action notice expert back in the day. So he's a good guy, good guy. Um, but... Uh, so I, this, the lawyer says, I need you to work on this case. You know, I need your opinion to help us. It was a, a case about 900 numbers and the client was MCI. Mm -hmm. Then a couple of days later, a call from a lawyer and they're prosecuting tobacco claims in federal court in Louisiana. We need a nationwide program to reach smokers. They were bringing, they were the first tobacco cases being brought to help bring uh, rest, you know, um, compensation mm -hmm. to smokers who were addicted and, and, and injured from, from, um, from smoking and all the, and, and they, 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 there was a mountain of evidence that the tobacco companies had hid their knowledge of addictive, addictiveness that had come out by some whistleblower at that point in time. So that's how I started back up in, so my company, which was Hillsoft became Hillsoft Notifications. And now I'm doing, you know, and, uh, do you end up in court a lot? I do end up in court a lot in my... And does your acting serve you? <laughs> I did. I, I, I enjoy testifying. I mean, I have, I've always had, you know, substantive experts working with me, mm -hmm. doing the media, like the, the detailed and really important substantive media research on, you know, crunching the numbers, figuring out. What, do we need television? Do we need radio? Do we need newspapers? Do we need magazines? Do we need, you know, how much, how much exposure are we getting from banners on the internet, uh, which is a whole problematic topic in, in, the, in the world of advertising today because it's such a gray area and a lot of fake, eh, talk about mm -hmm. a lot of fake 
uh, promises from, from exposure to internet banners. But I've always had a great ex substance of experts developing that behind me, but I always like to be the one um, presenting in court, taking the information and presenting it and testifying. Because I like, I sort of like the, I always used to really like the sort of the, almost the battle mode of like being prepared to face any question that would come to me and mm -hmm. have the answer and like, um, and, ref and deny that lawyer his aha moment. <laughs> <laughs> But, did you, did uh, you study theater in school? How did you get to the theater? Uh, How did you get to no, theater part of it? Was it through this job? Was it through it your, was. your get, I'll was get, it? I get to, oh. I'll get to that because we were, we were notifying Holocaust survivors um, all over the world when the Swiss banks settled their claim. We had this man, if you remember, this man was sitting at a Swiss bank in uh, Zurich and he was, he was a night watchman and he was down in the basement and, then, and the bank, these Swiss banking officials would bring him these these boxes of old papers. And they'd say, here, shred this. And he would sit there all night long and, sh and he'd be told to shred these. And he started looking at them and they were Jewish account records. They were all Jewish names and they were, and they were from the 1930s. And, and so he's like, he blew the whistle. And he said, there, and then that's how lawyers in the United States brought claims against the Swiss banks for, to, re for, for, re for just to have them disgorge what really was something books were written about seven billion dollars in um in 1990s money of jewish assets that they just kept and so they said they eventually the swiss banks and the swiss government settled for about one point we got we got like 1.25 billion dollars to distribute to survivors their heirs uh, all over the world and um so we were doing that we were doing that case and with a great team uh, including a man named Jerry Benjamin, who's a, a great organizational outreach sort of, he, he was active in political campaigns and he was really a great organizer and networker. And he had many, many contacts in the Jewish organized community, of, you know, organizational world throughout. And, and so I traveled around with him all over Europe, you know, trying to figure out how to get notices to, let's say we got, you know, destitute Holocaust survivors in the Ukraine. And he, he, and he, we'd be like, we went into a, an organization that distributed food packages to like the remote parts of the Ukraine, for example. And we'd, and we'd, we'd say, how can we work with you to put a notification inside the food package so that they could make a claim? And, and we did things like that. And um, so we came back and he, and we, I would talk at endless conversations with him just about life in general. And, um, and he, he said he had this opportunity through this, friend of his, a producer, great producer, Dave Fischelson in New York, a theatrical producer. And, and he said, you know, we're trying to mount a show about Golda Meir and her, uh, her career, <laughs> life and career. And so I was like, he said, I, so I, he signed me up to be one of the producers. And um, so we did that and, uh, and turned out to be the long, it was Tova Feldschen was cast. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, and, and it ran for, well, you put it in your promo piece. Four hundred and eighty-seven performances. Yeah. yeah, I think it's still. Was is. that your Was that your first performing or a producing? Uh, yeah, it really title? was. It was. I know it was, and it was fun. And uh, and it, and but it wasn't until I sold the the, you know, my partner and I sold our company in two thousand five to a big company that it sort of administered the class action. Mm -hmm. My job in our role in the field was always designing and, and testifying about the adequacy of the programs of, of the outreach, the advertising, yeah. but there's a whole other bunch of companies that administer and handle the 800 numbers, and administer the claims and make sure everyone gets paid. And um, so we sold the company and, um, and went, and that's when I sort of had more free time. And it's like, yeah. And, oh, I had done, I had done some work for the federal judicial center. Uh, our firm had designed, you know, the, sort of standards for how to notify people properly. Mm -hmm. And one of which was designing sort of plain language documents to, 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 so that the world of notifications was not little fine print legalese, but really easy to understand, looks more like, like why you would want to read. Yeah, like <laughs> a headline that captures the attention of the person right. to capture. 
and then tell the and describe their rights and options in really simple short yeah and i had advocated that for the federal government and as part of that i was invited to start doing like sort of judicial education videos and i would and i <laughs> and i got i got on to doing this thing where it was kind of like a jay leno style um like man on the street so i would go to like i would go to rittenhouse square with a camera crew um and, and um and uh and and, and I'd, I'd i'd ask just random people like i'd read words from a bad legal notice and I'm like what does that mean to you and that's <laughs> the funniest, funniest answers you know? and i want to see these if we have the links i want to post them. i look really do you young. have any of this video <laughs> I, should have, I should have given you one yeah, you gotta do that we gotta um, put that up in the chat <laughs> it was so fun and the, you know, oh, I and bet there you were be, really good at that. There would be a there. Like, I remember this one guy. He looked he probably he looked like like I, I read this like sophisticated legal, legal <laughs> really bad notice. I was trying because I was trying to make the point that you can't communicate yeah. for average people uh, with legalese because they're just gonna like not even understand the remote <laughs> what you're talking about. So this one, this one guy, he looked like, and he's like, it sounds like I'm gonna go to a prelim hearing. I mean, he's like, <laughs> his his only connection was criminal justice. I was like, no, no. Well, no, but it, but like it, one could be con very confused very easily, right? Which is the point. I think it's a, like a, a really. Uh, I I definitely want to see the video, to the the video of that. So then, what was the first professional sort of? I want to I want to definitely get the Hudson Theater Works in here and the work that you're doing with them and talk a little bit about the caretaker. When did you decide like okay, you know, uh, and and how did you find Hudson Theater Works? I've studied in Philadelphia with, uh, like with really had a lot of fun studying improv with Jill Whalen, who many people don't know, spent a few years in Philadelphia. She was, she was the love boat, the kid from love boat. Oh yeah. Really funny. And she taught, she was teaching improv. I studied with her with a great bunch of people that we had so much fun. And then, and, and I studied with Frank Licata. Frank came mm -hmm. down to Philadelphia and taught. And I studied uh, with him. And, and uh, Frank runs. Uh, Frank is Frank Frank's is the, the producing artistic founding artistic director mm -hmm. of the Hudson Theater Works. So, and so he turned me on to that, and I started becoming more and more involved in that, and became a member of, of the Hudson Theater Works company up there. And um, which now, am I right in that you can see the building right from the bridge as you're so, going into? What's that? So, we talking about up in Hudson Theater Works, which is yeah. in New York, New Jersey. Yeah, right? but can't you see it? Right. You well, this, what's awesome is the city. Well, they started out um, uh, in, you know, creating performances wherever they could in Weehawken, but got eventually the city of Weehawken basically gave use of a a, a school building, a mm -hmm. uh, two Hudson Theater Works called the Woodrow Wilson School which is interestingly is the school where Jerome Robbins went to school, like Jerome Robbins of, you know, of Broadway fame, you know, chore choreographer, West Side Story and so forth. Um, that's where he went to school. Anyway, it's a cool little quip. And there's pictures of him on the stage that we perform on. Well, we, we built a, a sort of a proscenium uh, in, in the, 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 the school has the original auditorium, all the seats are removed, so it's just a big open space with big, beautiful high ceilings. And, and uh, we're fortunate to have uh, a man named Greg Erbach, who is a co-founder co with Frank. And Frank, uh, Greg is, an, is a brilliant electrician, electrical engineer, and, and works with the Metropolitan um, Opera uh, in, his, in his day job and 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 but all the rest of his hours of his day are spent produce as, as our pro production manager and who's created a, a great um system of, of you know bringing incredible lights in there we have a whole big nun bunch of new lights donated by by rutgers um uh, school, school a drama school which is where greg went um uh, but um but the the school building is from the school from the theater uh, you are five minutes away from Times Square. So you can but just right at the foot of, I mean, it's yes. right, we Hawkins right at the foot of the Lincoln Tunnel. Yeah, right. So it's a great location for, for actors, you know, for, you know, it's a professional equity theater company. So it's a great uh, and great, you know, great 
depth of depth of talent that gets involved there. Great, um, very. I've been endlessly impressed with the this, the the passion towards you know serious work being done there. It's not a community. It's not a community theater by any stretch of the imagination. And so. Well, I, yeah, in taking on Pinter's The Caretaker, uh, which we'll put the links up for Hudson Theater Works and everybody can check out their virtual festival and we'll get to that a couple, uh, a couple of the work that they're doing right now. But I want to talk a little bit about, you, you did some, some research and you took a, then you head over to London to do some research. Well, yeah, but I mean, if you the, remember, well, Hudson applied for the rights to produce caretaker I think in like 20 maybe 2016 2017 and was denied mm -hmm. because and we didn't quite know why we thought you know New York area production getting the rights to do it they, and um, maybe they wanted um, we weren't sure why we were getting we, yeah. why we were denied I came to um, but they're very that they're the Pinter estate is notoriously difficult to sort of um, negotiate with they have very you know, great restrictions, great, great care. There's um, uh, the agent in in London for the for the for Pinter's estate is very protective of the work, mm -hmm. which is God bless her. That's great. It's uh, it's important. Um, so it was, we thought, ah, oh, how are we going to get the right? So I came to you. Remember, I said, you know, can you help mm -hmm. me? We, maybe we can put it on in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was talking to you about it, and we, we were going to go that route, if you remember. Yeah, like, well, we were looking at buildings here. We were trying to find the right space for it, right. the right, which right. you guys ultimately, the, the set, which you also designed, is, is quite something. And I can imagine in the, sen in the, in the context of... Um, yeah, I, know, I'll, this... talk about, I'll, I'll talk about that, because I wanted it to be very immersive. In Philly, if we were going to do it in Philly, I, liked, I wanted to do it in a space where you could actually feel like you're... Like, a voyeur into an attic where the where the mm -hmm. where the play, where the where the action the whole play takes place and um and we were looking at spaces like that like some of those really cool yeah the, the old churches and the whatnot yeah right but it, yeah. it just wasn't working and then mm -hmm. we thought why don't we just apply frank frank said you know why don't we just apply again yeah and um and we actually had more seats at that point and so we applied again and we got it so and we're like i, I had actually was over in london I thought I, I wanted to, my, my idea was I wanted to, it's like, I wanted to do a couple things. Number one, in, an immersive production uh, where the audience is right up there, you know, next to the, the peeking, peering in at the attic. And number two is integrate film because I knew that Pinter had this great, um, great love of film. You know, there's some great um, Pinter f screenplays that people don't, mm -hmm. um, realize or to remember you know um which you can see on youtube old old th screenplays that he wrote that are um like pumpkin like the pumpkin eater mm -hmm. uh, a great old great movie from the from the 60s and uh recommend it and uh and uh languish go down uh, an old judy De young judy dench mm -hmm. and jeremy irons really great interesting film um but it so happened, so I'm over there in London I'm, and I'm digging through the, the uh, British library for, cause that's where um, Pinter's archive was donated to the, Pinter, to the British library. So you have to go into this archive room to see all the old materials. And you can see the original manuscripts. You can see letters between he, he and Samuel Beckett. Like you can have your hands on like Samuel Beckett's letter to Pinter and they, and what was, what was funny about that is that like the the letters back and forth between Pinter and Beckett, I was like expecting to read like you know, I talked about this with you at some point. I yeah. think uh, so. I was expecting to read these like these erudite uh, <laughs> this, this, this discussions. Lots of, of prose and theatrical themes mm -hmm. and plots and so forth. And it's really just like it's like a lot of it was just sort of like a like a bitch session about <laughs> about. Like, oh, I can't believe what this producer's trying to do. They're screwing it up. Why can't he, you know, why won't he let me, leave me alone? Beckett's, you know? was this Pinter or yeah. was Beckett? Both so Beckett's them. responses were because. Both of them. That's so. <laughs> Just mundane, like, production difficulties. <laughs> Same stuff, different day. 
Oh, uh, so, so what was the hardest thing for you? I, I so want to get a hold of a Pinter play soon. They've been on the list. Birthday party, a number of them have been on the list. The caretaker was on the list, but then, you know, you know, uh, you guys did it. And um, what was like, what was the biggest challenge just of working on that work? Do you think as, a, um, as an actor? Uh, I can suspect, but. I think it's, it's, it, 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 I think it'd be, it's, you have to find the humor. You have to. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, Michael Billington talks about that, who did his, who wrote um, Pinter's right. um, biography. He talks about like, you, yeah, sorry, Anna, I'm, I'm totally interrupting you. It's <laughs> like, I find, I mean, I just think it's like lyrically perfect comedic timing mm -hmm. that makes that sing, that makes that production sing. And you have to get the humor, which mm -hmm. also comes out of, British speech patterns, which is completely normal and understandable in to a person from from England. But yeah. We are not necessarily, you know, we grow we didn't grow up with that sort of comedic um, understanding. But when you more you the more you listen, the more you read, the more you watch, um, then you Was it a lot of repetitions? Was it just um yeah. Was it just being in the room, just sort of musically working your way through it, the sort of dance of the language and the physicality? And you've worked with Frank before, though, right? You guys have worked together on yeah. stage. Yes. Right? Yeah. Well, he, well he's, he has not, he's, when he performed as, as Davies brilliantly in The Caretaker, no, I, I also, that was also a, a really a, a thing that I wanted to do. I mean, we, he and I had, had yeah. numerous dinners and conversations where, I wanted him to have the opportunity to play Davies. Um, you know, he's he was a wonderful stage and film actor um, in through his twenties, thirties, forties, etc. Uh, you know, and 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 he hadn't he was he was really intent on directing, and producing, you know, and so he he was directing, but he and he'd done some some recently had done some more per, some some performing again and he was, he was interested in doing that so i was like really glad to get him on stage to do that but i perform he directed macbeth when we did that hudson theater works in uh 20 whatever 17 so that was fun and, and um and and what's hudson does this uh, uh, every spring of course nobody's doing anything this past spring but uh, a 10 minute play festival mm -hmm. done a couple of those uh, but um i think you know, going on five or six seasons now for Hudson or more. Um, some really great, some re really great serious work. And uh, so, yeah. I'd yeah, with, everybody with, definitely check it out. We'll put the links and more in the, in the chat box. It's, uh, box, it's up there um, too. I, I, I want to uh, talk about the work with the original, uh, the original piece called The Puzzle that I saw a workshop production of um, with David Shiner that, uh, that Julia Dunn wrote, that I'd love to talk more about that and where that is. In talking today before we got on the show, I, you, know, you said there was a, a subsequent workshop production where it's been developed more, but tell us about how you got involved in that and, um, well, just and where it's headed. Julia, great um, uh, budding playwright in Philadelphia. Um, came to know her through improv uh, in Philly and, you know, a lot of fun. And I, she, you know, as so I came to be familiar with a, a piece that she was working on that I really, um, I thought was really great. I thought it had great promise. And I thought, and she said to me, would you help me develop some workshops? Cause we really need to develop this play. And she'd reached out to David Shiner, the internationally well-known clown. Um, David Shiner of David Shiner and Bill Irwin fame, mm -hmm. which you can see, you know, uh, Full Moon, you know, you, you might remember Full Moon from the Broadway show. Um, and he came over, we brought him over in November from, from, from Germany. Germany. He lives in Germany now. He performs and he directs like the things like the, like the, the Swiss National Circus. Mm -hmm. He's done Cirque du Soleil, you know, he's directed Cirque du Soleil. Uh, pieces. He's, you know, of course, he's been on TV and film, and he was Cat in the Hat on Broadway too. Mm -hmm. Right out loud, he's uh, he's the real deal, and he's his physicality, and he is, is just incredible. His spirit, they like the the um, like he teaches like clowning at 
in Munich. Uh, and uh, he came over, we brought him over in November, I think of 2017, we had a workshop um, and did a, did a public performance at the 1812 Productions was really great in helping hosting a, a work, that workshop. And, and, um, and then we did a public performance at the Arden in their um, black box space, which, um, and, and it, was, it was great. We made a lot of progress and- Tell us about the content. Well, it's, it's, it, it's, it, is, it is essentially absurdist in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in that what you know is you, you see these two, these two who would appear to be homeless people that um, are trying to put together a puzzle like one of their activities, they're sort of like, they've been together, you can tell they've been together forever. And so they, 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 it's I, it essentially, you know, they act like an old married couple with a little bickering and so forth. Sounds and, very Beckettian. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're like trying to put together this puzzle and you get the sense that they've been working on this puzzle forever. And they're down and they realize they're down to the, the 10 last pieces. And then they can't bring themselves to put it together. They leave and in walks, in comes, in wanders in a boy who picks up the pieces and scatters them. They come back and they figure this out and they, and they, and they have to, and they realize that this boy can't really speak, um, that he has an odd way of sort of behaving and they're like trying to figure out what's going on. So they have to figure out, you know, how to basically communicate with this boy to, to solve the puzzle of the puzzle. The, the puzzle of solving the boy to solve the puzzle, and um, mm -hmm. so it's really about the interactions between the characters and how they and how, and you know, there's a literal literal sense of it, as I said when we were talking about from Juliet's experience um, about what it's like with an autistic child, which is, and it and it you know it was compelling to me that 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 the truth of that story, you know, the fact that mm -hmm. you know the fact that we look at, Juliet says, we look at, um, there's a tendency to, to, to look, to think because a, an autistic person who can't speak is somehow intellectually um, disabled, which is not, not true, you know. It doesn't mean they, they, they don't have amazing thoughts. Um, and so, so, but creating sort of a funny and irreverent way of telling that story where the boy essentially, you know, is is himself the hero, was was pretty cool. And I thought this is a great uh, way of of doing an important piece of theater and having it be interesting, fun, heartwarming, whimsical, um, engaging. So, but you know what, doing that, doing that workshop, and then talking with David Sh David Shiner loved the piece to the point where he's like. I want to, this piece needs to be done by clowns. And it wasn't sort of a self-serving conclusion that he came to. It was just the true conclusion. It needed to be done by clowns. And, and we said, you, and we said, you need to be one of the clowns. And he's like, yes, you're right. And so- Is it because the interior of the story it, it, was best expressed? It, because it needed to be less literal. It needed yeah, to be yep. more about more, the reality mm -hmm. and the humor coming from the interpersonal relationships yeah. and not about the, the sort of missteps of, right not about the way you deliver the line mm -hmm. the way you the way the characters sort of perform miss them. each other and find each other and right. because physicality is and and sort of neurologically that right. all figures and and right. and is in in the mix there so profoundly yeah in your experiences with precise um, yeah. So yes. we realized we realized we need to work on this again uh, with clowns, and so through David's help and um, conversations, you know, and coordination between us, we um, uh, we were really fortunate to get um, uh, an actor uh, by the name of Mickey Rowe involved in the production. Mickey Rowe is a, an, an autistic actor who um, has has had some terrific publicity lately because he's. He was the founding uh, artistic director of the National Disabilities Theater, which is in a partnership with the La Jolla Playhouse, huge, huge operation in California. And um, that, um, and he loved the, he loved the idea of it, loved the part, 
he came out to another workshop in no, in um, uh, November of 2019, I think. Yeah, um, to Philadelphia, uh, and that this that time we worked with Blanca Shishka, who helped us with provide space. We had talked to her about this, and we provided space at their rehearsal uh, location in South Philly, and and so David, and also a, a, a tremendous clown by the name of Daniel Passer got involved, and he's. Uh, he teaches at Cal Arts, uh, clowning, and he and he's performed uh, Cirque du Soleil, lots and lots. He's really funny, and he and David together as the two sort of adults in the room uh, are just a great partnership. And just so working on that physicality and the and the chemistry between them became the subject. And through all the way getting mostly through Act One at that play at that um, workshop. Um, was um, was a big uh, big advancement for the play. Mm-hmm. So. For the play. But it, it still features the relationship and the boy coming in is the puzzle. Is is that storyline still there where oh, yeah. the, the boy yeah. is the one who? Yeah, and so yeah. Um, so how it how it ends, how it wraps up, I, I think is still to be determined. Mm-hmm. But, um, but it's still it's still a work in. A Still workshop in progress. That's wonderful. Yeah, I think David and Mickey and a lot of people in, interested, and um, I think Juliet's very excited about that. Um, and some Broadway producers have been looking at it. I've talked to Dave Fischelson about it, and you know, he's um, it's got you know I think it, it has a lot of possibilities, but it needs to needs like like all of the things we do. Mm-hmm. Obviously, yeah, you need to you need to work on, it, but but it's been fun, and I'm really. I'm happy for Juliet to hopefully be bringing something like that to life because it'd be really, it'd really be a message. An important story for people to know. Yeah. Mm. What projects drive your decisions? I mean, are you, do you actively look for, for projects to produce or is it sort of just, I mean, do you feel like those, the creative process that you used back when you were in your early days, your Mad Men days, does that still um, drive your your choices about the projects that you'll put yourself into and the stories that you want to tell, either as a producer or as an actor? Or and, and I, d- I definitely want to get to your work with the Green Allies too, your environmental uh, advocacy work. Um, yeah. How well, do you so decide it, it, where to put your time? Where I have it's where I have time and when I have time. I mean, I I I um, I. I don't, I am not, I wouldn't call myself, you know, actively like 90, you know, pushing my theatrical producing. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I have an idea that I want to want to exploit. I like to try to bring it to life. That's what I think mm-hmm. that's how the caretaker happened. And maybe the next piece will happen that way. And that's maybe why I love getting involved with the puzzle, but we'll see. But I mean, my, you know, my, my, my defective products work steps in and I get, I get, you know, like I get um, diverted you know, for something like mm-hmm. uh, 20, well, 2017 became all about, 2016 and 17 became all about trying to bring, trying to, I saw this, you know, we talked about this, this uh, uh, came to my attention that there was this class action settlement where the Remington Rifle Company would be given a complete release of all claims involving what apparently was a defective trigger that has been in the most popular rifle in the world for the last 50 years and nobody knew that it was, that they knew it was defective and could actually fire without the trigger being pulled. And, and, you know, I'm not a gun lover myself. I I don't own a gun, I've never hunted or anything, but the stories, the personal stories of people who unwittingly didn't even picked up a gun to go on their hunting trip with their kid and didn't know that this trigger was defective and bam, the gun goes off, the little boy is killed. So many of those stories. And then here came a settlement where they, they, they purported to, to they, they, alleged, they, they said, we're, we're, we're willing to fix every rifle in the, in, and there's seven and a half million of these out there. We're willing to fix them all for free. But then I figured out that they had developed a notification program it was just a sham that no one would actually find out about it. Therefore, no one would actually file a claim and therefore none of the guns would actually get fixed 
and the lawyers would take home $12 million for their efforts. And that and the class members, these seven and a half million people, these guns would still be out there and never get fixed. And the fact that it was Philadelphia lawyers and a Philadelphia advertising person who did this stuff just got me lit up to the point that I wrote a pro bono letter. I wrote a letter on my own and worked on that case pro bono for free for two years to try to educate the judge. And I pushed it all the way to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, in which just before that hearing, Remington declared bankruptcy to probably to escape the liability from this. But um, and in the course of that, as you know, I, I you know, I was participated in, uh, you know, a, a really kind man in Mississippi uh, had suffered through a horrific incident where his one boy accidentally killed his other son and um, and went to jail for it because nobody could imagine that a gun can fire with by itself. Yeah. And um, so we got an episode on 60 Minutes about that. And it was, and I think we got more claims. So, you know, from that 60 Minutes episode, mm -hmm. minutes episode more claims for repairs to the gun that the, than the entire class action notification program uh, had done which is which is a travesty and so I, i've been i've been it's through that and it was a connection at that point in time there was this like sort of like this class action system might be broken problem that i sort of drew me back in there so i didn't i, I haven't i've been doing theater and and when i can mm -hmm. and yeah. it's and as you said in the midst of that whole you know leading up to that um um i was fortunate enough to help to help preserve uh, land in Upper Potts Grove Township. This is all different divergent. Land. Yeah, let's go to the Green Allies. <laughs> it's uh, it's divergent, but it's it, it, it's, it's linked. My 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 I, my grandmother lived at a seventeen acre farm in Potts outside of Pottstown, and we went there growing up. Uh, it's wooded. It has beautiful fields. It has many like I was. I, my mother inherited it and she was thinking of developing it, although she really didn't want to. And I remember like being told like, this is, I, people from the township would come out and say, you really should preserve this. It's like, there's so many unique, rare species of trees and fruit trees and other, it was a really cool um, environment. And my kids had been involved in Souderton School District with a program called SAVE, S-A-V-E, Students Against Violating the Earth. And, um, and it was an environmental club run essentially by the students. And, and the, t the, the, the teacher, his name is Ken Hamilton, um, encouraged that. And he was a brilliant advanced environmental studies educator. And he had his kids at Souderton down to Washington DC multiple times for awards from the White House. Um, and, and so, it came, I said, I don't really want to develop this land. And I, and I took it over from my mother because she could just didn't, you know, she was just worn out trying to deal with these terrible developers. Uh, and I said, let me buy you out and, and try to see what we can do. And then the township said, what can we do to save this? Right then I find out that a, a, the, a power company that owned a right of way along this really unique and scenic country road right on one edge of the property that ran like for a mile. Um, and I learned that it was deemed officially, officially deemed by Montgomery County, Pennsylvania as, as one of the rare, unique and scenic country roads. <laughs> Who knew there were such things? But they had cut down 298 trees just for, out of, for their own convenience so they wouldn't have to come back and keep pruning. And they dropped the tree, the trees dropped into the forest, thereby damaging lots of other trees and then they and then they cut them down and so at the end of the day my, this this township official says have you seen what's going on down that road it's, it's Snyder Road and I said no he said it looks like a logging camp well you know lo and behold yeah they had just mm -hmm. devastated it so I, I was in the position I had to like had to sue them and um, as a result um, long story they settled and and the funds from that helped the township acquire the land and agree that a new organization, and we had my, myself and my cousin, Jack Aldhouse, who had worked with SAVE, 
talked to Ken Hamilton, we said, why don't we start an environmental nonprofit and take what was done by the SAVE Club, the model of the SAVE Club for students and create a model on a worldwide basis, you know, on a national basis, to help other kids see how they could start environmental clubs. And it, and it took off from there. We preserved the land and it's an arboretum called the Alt House Arboretum. And the organization is called Green Allies. And we do, we're in our fifth year now. We do, uh, we do educational seminars for college kids. We have, um, you know, we're up to the point where we've had five of them, 20 different, 52, uh, 50, we've had 52 college interns from 25 different colleges. We've had, uh, you know, an average of 200 students a year at our environmental conferences every winter. At, um, and what um, do they learn? Is it how to be uh, the, good how to, how to solve How to solve campus environmental uh, mm -hmm. issues, which is one a big one is food waste. Mm -hmm. um, how to promote sustainable practices, how to take projects into their own communities, how to become an environmental leader. Kids love what I learned and saw and have seen firsthand is kids just, not because they want to be like sort of protest the, the, the bad stuff that's going on, which is horrible in, in environmental practices, because it, it, it's a positive, optimistic uh, outlet for what they want to do. They, you know, that's just the way, you know, organic farm. We have this mm -hmm. organic farm that started by high school students it's, and out at the Arboretum, it's bigger than a football field. We uh, provide food with our partner, Tower Health. We deliver food to families in need out there. In the pandemic, the police are helping, the, the mm -hmm. local police are helping deliver food that could not be otherwise delivered. We've developed a thousand pounds of, a thousand pounds of organic, of, of, of carrots, you know, cucumbers, zucchinis, potatoes, you name it are growing and being delivered to families in need. So it's healthy, providing healthy organic food. Um, it's, just, it's, just, it's just such a positive thing to get involved with. That, so it seems um, like it, it, it sort of helps them understand all the way around, whether they come at it from an organic farming perspective yeah. or how to, how to get it operationalized and, and or so for many different ways. And it's high school and college, did you say? High school and college students. Yeah. And We've created, we've, we're creating manuals for how high schools around the country can start clubs of their own, sort of a blue book or, or um, you know, pol you know yeah. policy guide for how to, Way do, to do it. How to do what we do. We do summer camps uh, for kids where they're out in the Arboretum. Um, we fed, we, and we've had partners like Cornell University's uh, public garden management students have come down and developed. Um, plans for uh, how how the arboretum can recover from uh, the ash. There was there was this there was this insect that infected all the ash trees in America. I don't know if you've heard about this, but we had two hundred some ash trees that had to come down. So the arboretum lost a big swaths of its canopy. We had Cornell involved with that. We've worked with the Franklin Institute. We've had um, you know a lot of great. And we Philadelphia University's architecture department has collaborated with the Green Allies to develop um, uh, installations or you know to on site at the Arboretum. Uh, their 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 four their fourth year students did that twice in a row. We're, we're working on a mobile classroom so that we can take sustainability practices to sort of drive in to the uh, to the parking mm -hmm. lot of a grade school, of a middle school. Take it out to the younger have, kids. And sort of have a hands-on, uh, a hands-on, please touch kind of experience. So that's been, so when you, when you talk about, you know, what are, you know, what am I doing next in theater? It's like, I, I love performing. I love, I love helping produce something that's interesting and exciting, but I, I have, I but you're, you know, you're doing that in out. the community. It is a production, right? It's a stage, and you know, this is the production, which is Green Allies, and it. Right. I think all those things converge, and uh, all right. those things, all those skills that you have, and the passions that you have, and the projects that you know. Um, there's a there's a lot to be done, whether we're literally on the stage or not, and it's just great that those skills can. It's just a a, a fascinating journey that you've had through advertising and the way in which you've used that to, you know, to really fundamentally help people um, that otherwise, um, you know, yeah. have gotten it. it. So 
don't Thank get me you. wrong. Don't get me wrong. Everything's not so, uh, you know, sometimes we have class actions where the, the, the allegation is that the, uh, the food, the food package included three less teaspoons of, of, of <laughs> It's like, it's not very, <laughs> very easy to get excited about the yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so. yeah. Always though, right? Always. That's, that's part of it. That's we part of it. We do what we have to do. We do what we, right? we have, have to do, yeah. Well, Todd Hilsey, thank you so much for taking the time to share your all the many things that you were involved with, which are, are really illuminating and exciting on so many different levels. And I really look forward to talking to you more about the puzzle and how that's coming along and, and the work, uh, you know, your acting work. I want to see you on the stage again at Hudson theater works. And I, and I really definitely want those links for the man on the street stuff in Rittenhouse square like this. I absolutely I have, a lot, I have a lot more. Hair. <laughs> I want to see these. I think it's a, a series in the making. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to be on Into the Absurd. And I, I look forward to your ventures in the future, Todd. Thank you. Good luck to you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And to, to everyone in the audience, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we hope you'll tune in next Saturday, September the 5th, when, um, when I'm super excited to be joined by Jonathan Mayberg. Jonathan, Jonathan is a New York City, um, he's a real estate professional, he is a developer, he's an entrepreneur, he works uh, alongside or with Nest Seekers International, and I have so many questions for him about finding an apartment, what is up with New York, what's happening, who's going, who's coming. He's got so many great stories. He's a, an artist, a, a, a theatrical, uh, loves the arts, and he uses that and weaves it into the work that he does, finding his clients the perfect space in the perfect place. So we'll talk to Jonathan Mayberg next week here at 5 p.m. on Saturday. And of course, as always, you can come in on the Zoom link. If you're not on the IRC's mailing list, please, please get on it and stay up to date with everything that's happening. And um, you can head on over to the IRC's YouTube page, Idiopathic Radiculopathy Consortium, and you can see all the creators and the folks that we've been chatting with over the last couple of months. So, um, and subscribe while you're there. That helps us get the word out to everybody and tell your friends. That's another way. We'll be on during the Fringe Festival every Saturday at 5 p.m. with lots of interesting guests coming up that we'll let you know about. And so that's it for this week, everybody. I'm wishing you a safe and happy week uh, as we roll ahead. And we do hope to see you here next Saturday at 5 p.m. September the 5th with Jonathan Mabel.